Good afternoon. My name's Meg Munn. I'm the Member of Parliament for Sheffield Healy. And today's webinar, my first ever, brings together two areas that I'm very interested in and have been doing a lot of work in Parliament on. My professional background was 20 years in social work, mainly in child care. I was Assistant Director of Children's Services in York. And in Parliament, I've wanted to continue that interest, but also work with other parliamentarians who are passionate about issues related to children. After the general election in 2010, I set up with the support of the NSPCC, the all-party group on child protection. And as part of that group, we've really tried to keep up to date with what's happening in the childcare area. That's meant looking at issues such as the Munro report, but also wider issues on child protection. I've also become very interested in the issue of women in science, engineering and technology, particularly concerned that 70% of women with qualifications in science, engineering and technology don't work in those areas, yet we have uh, shortages of expertise there. So in today's webinar, we're going to bring together those two issues. Um, I'm joined by lawyers and scientists who I will now introduce. To my immediate left, we have Lorna Savenka. She's a partner in the child care law practice of Han and Co. And she specialises in child care law. And she was named Family Legal Aid Lawyer of the Year at the 20. 20- 11 Legal Aid Lawyer of the Year Awards. Next to her, I have Debbie Jacobs, who's a principal at Gary Jacobs and Company. She also specialises in childcare, and she's been a member of the Law Society Children Panel since 1999. To her left, we have Sue Carney. Sue is a forensic consultant at Ethos Forensics. She's an experienced senior forensic biologist and she has a particular interest in sexual offences cases. And on her far left, uh, obviously not politically, it's not a political programme this, but uh, uh, we have Helen Swain who is also a forensic consultant but uh, she works for Foren- Forenzal Limited. She specialises in the examination and interpretation of body fluids, analysis of blood patterns, interpretation of complex DNA mixture, as well as the assessment of fire scenes. So we'll be having a discussion which will bring in all of those issues. So if we start perhaps first looking at the issues around the Monroe report, which was an in-depth look at what was happening in social work, which was driven uh, by a sense when this government came into place that social workers were spending far too much time uh, behind uh, computers, filling in forms and not enough actually getting uh, involved with children, but also this real sense that we needed to somehow accelerate the court processes. So uh, perhaps, Lorna, I can come to you first to talk about what your experiences have been over the years and maybe where where things are going now. Um, Yes, thank you. Obviously, um, I think the profession as a whole would welcome many of the recommendations of the Munro report in its its wishes and aims, but uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, issues really facing uh, practitioners in future is going to be how to put those aims into, into reality. Um, obviously it, w- it would be great to see a greater professionalism of the social work profession it would be great to see speeding up of court processes um, and it would be fabulous to see some more direct work with families at earlier stages before things necessarily have to get into court proceedings um, but uh, we, we really have in the last couple of years um, certainly certainly during the recession seen um, Child, child care um, services diminish. We've seen legal aid services diminish. We've seen uh, the uh, court budgets diminish. And so there really are some challenges to fit those two ideas together in the current climate. Um, my, my work um, for the last, uh, most, well, most of the last 10 years has been entirely in <coughs> child care um, proceedings um, where children are being taken into care and um, uh, the case um, which uh, I um, received some some fame for me perhaps <laughs> for, for uh, the year before last was uh, relating to um, some scientific issues that arose in uh, alcohol hair strand testing 
Um, and um, one of my concerns about everything that, that, that comes out of the Munro report in terms of speeding processes up is that sometimes you may end up with some real miscarriages of justice and in the way in which um, these proceedings lead ultimately may lead to an adoption of a child which is irreversible it can be um, probably the most draconian thing that any court in this land can do, certainly more serious than sending somebody to prison, and that yeah. decision could be reversed later down the line if it's found to be a miscarriage of justice. Um, there are some dangers that we could uh, come into issues relating to trial by expert. Uh, I think um, yeah. there is already in the court arena some um, issues about the extent to which we're reliant on experts and whether we're reliant upon the right types of expertise um, to assist the courts in making decisions. Should perhaps I'll bring um, your legal colleague in, Debbie, there, <laughs> who's, uh, we were discussing beforehand how you'd seen a shift from asking social workers what yes. they thought, which was what used to happen in my early days, to really relying on experts. Do you recognise the picture that Lorna's describing here? Uh, absolutely. I think I have to just uh, agree with everything that Lorna has just said about uh, child proceeding, childcare proceedings and where we're going. I can remember when I first began, uh, became involved in childcare, um, the courts very much more accepted the advice that was given by the social workers. The social worker came to court, prepared a statement, gave evidence, whereas I think as the years have gone by, we, we become more focused on having experts involved. Um, Lorna used a phrase which is, is it's a well-worn phrase in childcare proceedings, but it's that, that when the court is being invited to make what can be seen as the most draconian orders, um, one's got to be really, really careful uh, about what evidence is available for the court to be able to base those decisions upon. And you've then got the real competing tensions between what we all agree, everybody who works in childcare um, acknowledges that um, everybody's got to work as quickly as possible and minimise delay for the children so that their, the child's best interest can be served by securing the outcome for them, where they're going to live, whether they're going to return to their parents if they've actually been removed. Um, or whether they're going to move on into adoption or to, 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 to remain in long-term foster care. So the court wants to make decisions as quickly as possible, but then the court have also got to get it right and allow the parties um, to take the time to instruct an expert, for that expert to be able to evaluate the papers, meet the families, see the children, where that's appropriate. It's not always appropriate. And then write up their reports. There are fewer experts that are now involved in, in uh, taking on instructions in this field of work. And that comes back to, to as, as Lorna has already said, the, um, the, the reduction in legal aid funding. There has been a drastic slashing in, in um, experts' fees from um, earlier this year. And uh, it really has had a knock-on effect. Things will settle down. Mm. Uh, but the courts really do need to refocus on looking at the best evidence they've got and from the practitioners. Um, I think we, we spoke before we, we came into this webinar about the, the role of the social worker ultimately at the present time is almost in, in its, that their role has been de-skilled in terms of what they can offer to the court and they're signposting the court to, to this expert or this piece of, this piece of written work. It's what, we, what we really, I think, it, it, and, and what comes out of the Monroe Report is the idea of focusing everyone's minds on what the social worker has to say. Uh, and then bring in, in, into that the, 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 the advice from the children's guardian. But that's another whole, that's another whole area. Next well, to, uh, well, certainly. Perhaps and, we and, may have time to revisit. And, and reflecting just a bit on, on what you've said there, it's also that the whole process really isn't as black and white as perhaps no. we'd like to portray it, because you may be looking for clear evidence, but what you then do with it and then what happens to the children is a much more complex process and saying that if they're over this line, they're definitely going to be adopted and they can never go home is not necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if they're over this line, then that's OK, we'll take a risk and they can be at home. In my experience, it's not like that. I wonder perhaps, uh, Lorna, if you can give us a bit more uh, information about the, the hair sample case and how that helped because I know there was always this big debate when I was um, working in childcare about what evidence have you got and particularly where you're talking about chronic behaviours how do you have good evidence that that's happening and then if you have that evidence how does that help you make decisions perhaps if we can uh, get a bit more detail about that and then we'll bring in the science experts <laughs> who will perhaps tell us whether these things are hard and fast or, or not Yes, well, that, that case involved um, a woman who had uh, self-admittedly uh, been an alcoholic in the mm. past and um, she had gone into rehab. She had um, one child at that stage who um, had um, 
already been taken into care voluntarily um, because she was um, accepting her issues. Um, and uh, she was working towards whether she could get that child back. And during the course of the proceedings, because they did go on for two years, um, she, she gave birth to another child. And um, ultimately, the um, issue came down to um, a hair strand test that um, we'd received just before what should have been the final hearing in the case. Um, and that, that uh, hair strand test indicated that she had been drinking between 20 and 50 units of mm. alcohol per week, which obviously is a, a lot of alcohol. And, and certainly for, from my point of view, being her lawyer, didn't ring true really um, because um, she was being seen five or six days per week by mm. professionals. Um, and anecdotally, I think um, there had always been some uh, disquiet amongst mm. practitioners really as to whether the alcohol hair strand testing was entirely reliable. And then through the course of the following year, really, um, the, the proceedings got uh, delayed somewhat worse whilst the case transferred up to the High Court mm. and um, another alcohol hair strand test was conducted, mm. which showed that essentially she was going to be um, abstinent to, mm. to, all, to all intents and purposes. Um, and really, uh, what, what seemed to get lost in, in, in that case a little bit was the focus on the idea that um, one has to look at the behaviours and whether the child is actually suffering harm. Um, and instead, we got perhaps sidetracked into an issue about wh whether one test was more reliable than another. Mm. Um, and that caused significant delay in the case and a lot of distress for my client, I can say. Um, but uh, ultimately, um, I, I, I felt that um, we had, at the outset, very very good social work evidence of the mm. fact that you know she had been drinking. The social work statement in the mm. outset kind of set out some, some issues around that. She had then gone into rehab. We had seen a dramatic change in her mm. presentation. I think all of the um, social workers and everybody involved in the case um, acknowledged that, mm. perhaps privately, they couldn't say so in terms of um, sort of the competing interests mm. actually in the case, because obviously child protection professionals have a job to do in, in, in putting forward um, the, the potential risks in returning mm. a child home. But essentially, two years down the line, we're in a situation where... Um, Certain, certainly privately everybody was acknowledging that she didn't appear to be a drinker mm. um, and that uh, her behaviour and the way she'd conducted herself, at least for the, for the, for the second mm. year of the case, mm. had been exemplary. Yeah. Um, and so one, that one has to remember that this shouldn't be a, a trial by test, mm. um, which essentially it had become, that we, it had almost been used as um, a shortcut, really, mm. to trying to find an answer. Mm. The, test, mm. the test was going to be used to say, oh, yeah, that's well, fine, she's, um, not, uh, mm. she's not drinking mm. alcohol mm. anymore, that's fine, so therefore the child can go home. When, in fact, actually what needed to be looked at was the whole of the picture mm. um, and that the test in itself, whether, whether reliable, as it turned out, the, the first test perhaps wasn't mm. reliable and there were some um, issues that arose at the final hearing with the, uh, the, the, the testing company... Um, giving um, some contradictory mm. evidence to, to some things that they'd said before and it, essentially accepting that uh, the, the test probably would show that uh, mm. if it had been repeated by them that, that she probably was abstinent. Um, but um, it, it really became a trial, trial mm. by expert which um, I think really missed the second point of the the welfare tests that one yeah. has to go through legally. The, the, the first point is that the threshold criteria have to be met. That is, is a child suffering significant harm at a point where essentially services become involved and, and um, uh, care yeah. proceedings are taken. But the second test is, is whether it's in the welfare of the children to yeah. go back to a parent, into care, yeah. um, perhaps to another relative... Um, and uh, uh, science can't really make that decision. No, and, and that understanding of the damage mm. that's done if a child moves from one family to another, even if the new family, in all other respects, would be perfect parents, it's not their mm. family, and so how, how does that all impact upon it? I, I know before you come on to the scientists, yes. but I, I think following on from what Lorna's just said, these tests and specialist tests have a very useful role to play within care proceedings, whether it's at the beginning as a yardstick from which you can measure the progress a parent makes, but it shouldn't be the be and end all. Mm -hmm. And I think that it has to be used as a tool rather than it, it leading, the, leading the case. And I think that's perhaps yes. something that we've, we've all learned, not just with the use of hair strand tests or, or, or alcohol tests, with all medical e evidence and, and with all, in all fields of science. And I, I, I think that's... Uh, 
the, the, the balancing between science sure. and the law. Let's hear directly from our scientists and just be